Hello and welcome back to another episode of the weekly news on the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, the only man that brings the news for us, at least, is uh, Nick Bendel. Hello, Nick, again. Hello. Oh, and this is becoming a bit of a habit of ours. We just keep doing oh, this every week. Tell me about it. It's just like every Monday morning you wake up and it's like, oh, here's Nick again. Yeah. Um, it's um yeah, no, it's it's great having you on so that we can you can legitimize ourselves as a uh, a podcast with news. You're the relevant expert, so um in terms of bringing the news and i just talk about it yeah oh i thought this whole time you were legitimizing me well you know it's we gotta try okay so does that mean neither of us are legitimate or we're both more legitimate than we originally thought i don't know might have to check with my mum okay <laughs> But, uh, yeah, maybe that's a different story. That That's a different podcast? Yeah. But um, what have you been up to in the past week, Nick? Well, it's been a really busy week, Owen. For those who don't know, I'm the owner of Hunter & Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. And one of the groups we work with is financial advisors. We work with quite a few financial advisors. And during the week... I gave a presentation to a financial planning dealer group about how to attain media coverage. Wow. And were they suddenly in the news? Not yet, but I'm going to keep an eye out. Uh, what the, the feedback I got was that they not only found it interesting, but they also found it informative because often you see other parties in the news and you wonder how is it that this person or this company is getting coverage i'm better than them why on earth is the journalist speaking to that idiot yeah i was thinking the exact same thing you uh yeah thinking about a couple of people in in our industry and how they end up on on some news programs and it's just like that's ridiculous what do they know well, uh, you should have attended my webinar about how to get media coverage. Oh, well, um, all right. Maybe next time. Let me know about it. Okay, plus you needed to become a financial advisor. Oh, no, I decided a long time ago I didn't want to be one of them. Okay, well, too much compliance? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's good to know you've joined an industry with very little compliance. No, no, no. Compliance is very good. It's um, but for financial planners, you know, I, I feel I feel bad for them because it's the amount of compliance they need to do is just like extraordinary. Um, it is. Yeah, I, I feel sorry for them also. I, I've got a really good financial advisor, but I feel a bit sorry for him because he finds it hard to ask just an innocent question because with all the regulations, he knows that. To answer the question, he probably needs to write a 20-page document first. Otherwise, he will be breaking some sort of regulation. And it does kind of tie them in knots. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And um, they can't really give give proper advice to, um, to their clients uh, where they would like to and how they would like to. So, um, yeah, it's um, you know, trying to give advice with one arm tied, tied behind your back. It's... Um, yeah, a bit difficult. And what about you and Lee Field? What have you been up to over the past week? Oh, well, uh, we had end of month um, last week, which was um, um, always a busy time of month for us. And um, we, uh, it resulted in, in the month of September being our biggest month ever for um, uh, renting properties, so uh, leasing properties. Um, and a lot of activity so uh, and uh, across queensland wa as well as new south wales a lot of leasing in all those three states congratulations i know leafield your property management business it's just slowly steadily growing you're now in five states and yeah. congratulations on the record month thank you thank you and 
that that that's why I was kind of glad that we had a long weekend this this weekend. So I, I'm I'm never one to shy away from a, a a fun Monday morning of of getting into work, but for this Monday public holiday, yes, it's nice to have a little bit of extra rest. Ah, oh, so you're a fan of long weekends? Oh, just this time. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, let's get back to work. Yeah. But um, Nick, uh, you bring the news. What's in the news this week? Our first story today, Owen, Mortgage Broker Association calls for home loans reform. The MFAA has called for the APRA mortgage serviceability buffer to be changed in its submission to the Senate inquiry into Australia's financial regulatory framework and home ownership. The APRA mortgage serviceability buffer is prescriptive and lacks a framework to provide flexibility and scalability, the MFAA said. The serviceability buffer is applied uniformly across all ADIs without sufficient consideration for the nuances that might differentiate one borrower segment or product from another, especially over time, the MFAA said. While this approach may ensure a consistent baseline of prudential oversight, it can also result in a lack of flexibility that may inhibit access to credit, particularly in situations where a more tailored approach would be appropriate. So the MFAA has proposed, quote, a dynamic buffer that adjusts with interest rates, shifting up when interest rates decrease or down when interest rates increase. Owen, what do you think about that? Do you support the MFAA's call for the buffer, which is currently three percentage points, to be made dynamic and to shift based on market conditions? Um, yes, that that would be a good idea. It's because um, um, that would allow for, uh, for example, when interest rates go down, um, they're talking about the buffer increasing, and which would make sure that um, um, people aren't getting in over their heads when interest rates are at historic lows, and um, and when interest rates. Uh, effectively triple um, when they go back up, as we've experienced in in um, recent years, and uh, then not as many people would get into trouble. Um, and of course, when interest rates are a lot higher, but of course, uh, the RBA probably wouldn't like that because they're inter- raising rates or or lowering lowering rates for a specific reason. So if if we have a um now that reason isn't always related to home loan lending so it's um but it could it could be specifically a reason why the rba is changing rates to be able to help the property market so if apra is then fiddling with the uh, the 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 buffers to try and um even out those um ups and downs then that could could cause um, or could lessen the impact of uh, rate changes from the RBA. So you're suggesting that if uh, the RBA raises the cash rate and APRA simultaneously reduces the buffer, those two things might cancel each other out? Pretty much. Hmm. And I'm wondering, is there also the possibility that if the buffer's going up and down, would that be confusing for consumers? Um, well, consumers, if you ask the average borrower while they're um, putting in an application, if um, they knew what the uh, uh, the buffer was that was applied to um, their application, uh, they they wouldn't know. They uh, it's it's not something that is really talked about. Um, they they usually know what interest rate, um, like the delivery rate that they'll be getting. Um, after the loan settles, um, but in terms of the, the the buffer rate and the servicing rate, um, that's it's applied to um, the calculator um, for servicing. Then yeah, I, I I would I wouldn't expect anyone to to know that. Mm, it, it will be interesting to see if the government shows any inclination to uh to change the buffer i i have heard people arguing along the lines of the mfaa that it would make sense to have this kind of dynamic buffer and i can see the positives Mm. uh 
who knows though whether the government will do anything about it yeah like like anything like any change there's always going to be good and bad and it's um i, I like the sound of it and because it would uh, um make it make it easier um and more fair i think over the long term um but there's always going to be winners and losers out of any any change well, speaking of mortgages, our second story for today is, <clears throat> pardon me, home loans activity keeps rising. Mortgage borrowing has now increased for seven consecutive months and 17 out of the last 20, according to new data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. During that time, monthly home loan commitments have grown from $23.1 billion in January to $30.4 billion in, sorry, January 2023 to $30.4 billion in August 2024, an increase of 31.5%. More people have been buying property, which has meant more borrowing, more borrowing activity, and property prices have been rising, which has meant borrowers have taken out larger loans. I mean, what's interesting about this is that CoreLogic has been reporting that property price growth has been slowing, but the ABS Home Loans data shows mortgage activity is actually rising quite strongly. I'm wondering what are we to make of that apparent contradiction? Um, well, one doesn't necessarily always go with the other. It's um, you've got, um, yes, if price growth is slowing, um, the people who are buying are maybe the ones that can afford to borrow more. So they're the ones buying rather than the, the people who can't afford to um keep their lending at the moment um and they so they're the ones selling um so it's um it's something that is um has to be looked at independently um but there's usually some correlation there um, between it so it, it it shows that uh, we're probably in a healthy lending market at the moment um where the people who can't afford their their um, their loans are uh, getting out of the market uh, rather than trying to um, um, you know wait until they get into trouble. Hmm. So we've got the ABS saying that home loans activity has increased for seventeen out of the past twenty months, and CoreLogic has reported that the national median property price has increased for twenty consecutive months. Do you have any feeling? as to how much longer this property price growth cycle can last? Well, it's still growing on, you know, on average across the country, but it's um, growing at different rates around the country. Um, so it might be growing strongly in some areas that haven't um, grown much. And, and then it's um, might be even receding or starting to flatten off in other areas that have boomed in the last few years so it's um it, it's something that'll uh it, that'll come and go as as the tides do come in and out and it's um it, it's um something that as long as the economy is healthy we have good employment which we do and and the rest of the economy is healthy then um uh, price growth can continue until we get more supply. There were quite a few forecasters at the end of last year suggesting that property prices would go backwards, uh, the national property price would go backwards this year. It now looks almost certain that the national median will actually be higher at the end of 2024 than the start, but I'm wondering whether whether it might go backwards in 2025. Well, that'll all depend on the amount of supply that comes onto the market, and it's uh, the, the government promises of of bringing in um, x number of um, new dwellings um, into the market um, is obviously going to fail, um, and uh, uh, that that was their um, big push and big promise, and they're failing to to come through with that. So. Um, that'll result in higher property prices. 
Our final story today is one I think it'll be uh, one I think will be dear to your heart. Property investors striving for financial independence. What are the main reasons people invest in property? Well, according to a survey by Pippa, the Buyers Agent Association of more than 1,100 existing or potential property investors, the top reasons are 92% of respondents said to provide financial security. 83% said to be self-funded in retirement. 68% said to add to my retirement nest egg. 62% said to retire earlier or work less. 53% said in case superannuation tax rules change. 50% said in case the government can't support me. And 47% said to provide an inheritance. I went, do Pippa's findings match what you hear from your landlord clients? Um, absolutely. It's, um, it's people want to be able to take control of their lives and, um, and their financial futures. And uh, a lot of people aren't um, satisfied with um, uh, superannuation and, and how it's working. Um, so it's um, people want to invest in, in real brick and mortar assets. And yes, they can do that in super as, as a possibility, um, but it's not, not as easy to do. And um, there's a lot of restrictions in super as well. So um, yes, people want the flexibility to be able to um, control their, their financial future. I'm curious to know your philosophical position on something I'm going to put to you. I'm sure we'd agree that governments should not punish property investors, but do you think governments should support property investors or remain neutral? Um, well, it depends what you mean by support. It's, um, um, yeah, the, the government def definitely needs property investors in the market to, because um, it, it uh, without property investors, there would be um, a huge demand on public housing, um, which the government would need to supply. Otherwise, it'd be a, bit, a lot of homeless people. So um, something, yeah, large and drastic would have to change. So it's there's definitely a relationship there. Um, both need each other to be able to um, um, stay uh, with their investment. And um, and with that investment, it provides more taxes at the same time. So um, yes, if the government was to support and um, uh, and provide any better benefits to property investors, it well it well and truly comes back um, to the government in in higher taxes. You've also got the fact that if people are self funding their retirement, then the government doesn't need to fund their retirement. Oh yes, absolutely. It's um, yeah, in the long term, yes. If people have got um, uh, those assets to um, uh, provide an income for themselves in retirement, and, and of course, uh, remember that income will be taxed as well, um, even in retirement, and it's uh, and those taxes uh, are there to be able to help pay for the people who um, weren't able to. Um, invest for themselves during their work life. So would it be good for society if there were more property investors? Um, ab absolutely. It's, it's, um, I, I think there's a nice balance now. Uh, I, I don't think we need necessarily um, more uh, investors as a, as a percentage of, of, of all, um, of all, property uh, dwellings out there in the country, but we need more properties. Mm. So, which will mean that we'll need more investors as well. So um, it's a balance of both. Let, let's keep the percentages the same, but we, we need more supply. Uh, census data shows that about 65% of people own their own home and about 35% of people are renters. So you're happy with that percentage? Yes, yes. It's um, we've we've had that percentage for a long time on average, and and it works. So it's not like it's um, you know investors are buying up all the property. It's um, um, that we haven't seen that change at all. Um, they're not pushing up prices as a result. 
It's, um, as you just said, two thirds of the market uh, is owner occupied. And the majority of them have, um, are the ones that do the transactions for, um, for upgrading their current home. So they're selling and buying another to live in and that's where the majority of the market is made. So it's not with first home buyers, it's not with investors. So investors tend to keep their properties for longer um, and, and they're usually um, lower price properties as well. And so the, the market movers is, are those two thirds that already own a property and they're buying uh, or they're selling uh, to buy another one. It, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the coming decades, because as our society ages, there are now fewer taxpayers supporting each retired person than in the past. And at some point that might become unsustainable for the federal budget, which means either uh, people will, uh, the government will raise the retirement age or the government will reduce the pension. And therefore, it, it makes sense for people to look to self-fund to whatever extent they can, whether that's through property investing or investing in shares or investing through their superannuation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, always good to chat, Owen. Thank you oh, for sharing yes. your expert insights. And I think you've provided me with a lot of legitimacy in this podcast. Oh, thank you, Nick. You're so kind. <laughs> and 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 the 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 news this week um went went past so quickly i thought we had another story in us no we don't just the three but if you want more stories i guess you'll have to come back next week okay well i look forward to it as i do every monday morning great to chat owen see you next week you too thanks for joining us and um we'll talk again soon